Hello biology students! Today we're going to be talking about genetic technology part one. How do we make genes move across different species and why might we do that and are there other cool benefits to using genetic technology? Look at these mice that are glowing. Yes, those are actually mice that are glowing. Cool! So, what is biotechnology anyways? Biotechnology refers to a technology used to manipulate DNA. So in our starter slide, we had an example of taking a gene, uh, such as the firefly gene or a glowing gene from a jellyfish, and inserting it into a different species, such as a mouse, and making the mouse glow. We can also call this as a synonym genetic engineering. So I'm going to use biotechnology and genetic engineering as synonyms. Here's a really good example other than our cool mouse glowing example. We actually use this for medical and health reasons. So an example is to make the insulin protein that we learn can sometimes be mutated with people who have diabetes and can't process sugar. We can make that protein for them by inserting a working version of the gene from a human or cow species, a mammal-like species, and inserting it into bacteria, which reproduce and make proteins really fast. This would allow protein synthesis to happen really fast. The donor gene from our cow species inserted into the protein, uh, inserted into the bacteria, would make the cow's protein or the human protein really fast. This is how actually we make insulin for diabetic patients and we can make it in ginormous quantities so that we can sell it and give it to people who need it like diabetic patients because we couldn't get enough from just humans that can make it. We need to be able to put it into a species that can make it really fast and bacteria reproduce and make proteins super, super fast. Really cool application of this biotechnology or genetic engineering. Notice that all of these are going to be recombinant DNA examples. What do I mean by that? Well, the word recombinant has the phrase combine in it. It refers to combining DNA from two different sources. So in my very, very first example, I had the jellyfish glowing gene combined with mouse. Those are two different sources of DNA. In the previous example, we had the cow or human gene being inserted into the bacteria DNA that would be two different sources of DNA. We call that recombinant. A synonym is that is that this is a transgenic organism. So the mouse that was glowing is transgenic. It has DNA from two different sources. The bacteria with the insulin gene is transgenic. So we can do this sometimes as scientists to just experiment for fun, like our glowing mice on the first slide, but oftentimes this is done for medical reasons. Sometimes it's also going to be done to try to explore new types of food. So for instance, scientists, and you might have even seen this in the grocery store, have taken some genes from broccoli and taken some genes from cauliflower and made almost a hybrid or recombined DNA or transgenic organism through biotechnology called broccoflower that has some of the genes or qualities or proteins of both species pretty wild. So this is transgenic because it has the DNA of both organisms in it. Really wild. There are other types of biotechnology that we use in society, specifically for CSI or paternity tests, and this is a the process called DNA fingerprinting, and that's going to be our major focus for the rest of this notes, and we'll get back to the cool controversies of manipulating DNA in our next set of notes and during class, but now we're going to focus on this DNA fingerprinting. Well, we call it DNA fingerprinting because just like how your fingerprints are different than anybody else's, everybody actually has different DNA. We have very similar DNA. Our DNA is 99% similar across the human race, but those small differences in that 1% is going to be something that we could notice if we were to do a DNA fingerprint. How do we notice those differences? Well, we are going to create a DNA fingerprint 
and we're going to make it look something like this, which is actually DNA fragments. Let's learn about DNA fragments. How can I make and analyze DNA fragments, which are what these little bars or lines are? Well, when I get a DNA sample from a crime scene, I might have cells from hair, blood, semen, anything, a cheek cell, anything I can find on a crime scene, and I can get the DNA from it, and I'll use an enzyme to karate chop up the DNA in a very specific way. All right, so I'm going to have the whole amount of DNA, and this enzyme will cut the DNA in specific places, specific base sequences. For instance, this enzyme might cut every time it sees this sequence, CCC, GGG, and it'll always cut right where the C and the G are meeting. All right, and so where I have this sequence in my whole 46 chromosomes is going to be slightly different than where you might have this show up in your DNA sequences. And that'll make different lengths or sizes. Imagine karate chopping in different places along a long string. The string would end up being slightly different sizes. So different individuals are going to have different size fragments after cutting at these certain locations. Because those certain locations are not in the same place for you versus me. The only people who have the same exact fragment sizes are people who are identical twins. Okay? They're the only ones. That's the same with regular fingerprints, but DNA fingerprints are even more accurate. So now that I have the chopped up DNA, I will use a technique to separate those fragments across um, a electrical current. Okay, because now I have to be able to see the different sizes. To make the DNA fingerprint, I'll use a technique called gel electrophoresis. It has the word electro in it because it's going to use electricity to separate those DNA fragments by size. So here's the electrical component and the gel component is because this is like a jelly like substance we're going to put the DNA on. And it'll end up creating something that looks like this and we're going to practice analyzing these in class and doing CSI and paternity tests. So how does it work? Well, I'm not going to write down too much. You can just listen. But DNA is negatively charged. So if I have a negatively charged electrical current and I'm going to turn it on, the more DNA I have, all right, the heavier it'll be and it won't move as far. But if I have a really small sized piece of DNA, it'll move very far, all right? So that's how I'm going to separate them based on size. And they'll move along. Okay, I'll put DNA here and it'll move along its column and it'll separate out. So different organisms and different individuals will have slightly different bands or band sizes. Only identical twins would have the same exact. So I can use this as a paternity test. So I might draw this as a example. Okay. So for instance, here's a paternity test. The mother and the child are going to have DNA in common, right? So here we have the mother and the child have some DNA in common because they're related, but they're not exactly the same. The child, right, would get the rest of the DNA from its parent, the other parent, the father, all right? So the father would need to overlap in some DNA two and here they do this is an example of established paternity does the mother need to be exactly like the child no because mothers don't have exactly the same dna as their children neither do fathers but notice that the mother overlaps and the child overlaps with the father all of the child's dna is accounted for from either the mother or the father here we have no paternity established from this person accused as the father so the mother overlaps with the child, but this child has no DNA in common with the father. So this is not the father. How did we look at it? We looked across the rows, comparing each person's DNA, but I always look horizontally. We can also use this for criminal cases, okay? So here we have some basic kind of a control, but we're not going to pay attention to this first one. 
Here we're going to have crime scene DNA. So maybe this was blood found at the crime scene and we chopped up the DNA. The person who is the suspect who committed the crime should have all of the horizontal bands matching. So here it's not this person because it didn't match here. So we can eliminate person number one. Okay, all right. But here again, we're eliminating person number two who overlaps identically with this column. Suspect number three. So this is what we'll practice in class. Okay, and you'll be able to do your own CSI.